All right, everybody, let's welcome Amy Schumer. Mwah, mwah. Oh, hello. Thank you so much for coming. Is this an exciting crowd? Some of them. You guys, could you just keep it down in the store? Thank you. Hi, guys. Were you just in the neighborhood, or did you come here on purpose, or what? Purpose? Yeah. On purpose. All right, cool. Hi. Um, hi. Good to see you again. We got I to wrote my article in the New York Times, if anybody saw it Sunday. Good article, right? I, I, I will tell this audience, if you guys promise not to tell anybody, that there was a lot of discussion about how much cleavage to use in the photo. Wow. Yeah. Did you fight for my tits? I think they, they spoke for themselves. Yes, they did. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And what's the other thing that you had to fight for? Oh, you know, the Times, as you guys probably know if you read the paper. Edgy. They're, <laughs> they don't play by the rules. There's some language that, that we don't typically allow. But, you know, when Amy says that she's always been hosed before bros, we got to put that in, right? We got to put it in. Got it down. And yeah. then also, what kind of pet it's OK to <laughs> masturbate in front of. <laughs> I, we should maybe take a vote later and see if there's the Why consensus. Why do we do it now? Like, okay. do you think it's okay to masturbate in front of your cat? Okay, who says no? Wow. Dog. Okay. It's kind of even. This is kind of an uptight crowd, and I, I don't really know how the rest of this is going to go. Well, let's, let's start from the beginning. You are getting, like, straight just a shot of my clitoris. Like, please... No, it's not your fault. It's in your face, and this dress didn't support underwear. So we all do what we have to. Uh, I want to talk to you about being funny from when you were a kid. Yeah. Your sister told me that you used to make up characters yeah. when you were little. Did you always have a sense that you were funny? I was always making people laugh, but I didn't think it was a good thing. It kind of bugged me because I felt like they were making fun of me, but they were... It was explained to me. Um, I, did a, I did a production of An uh, Sound of Music when I was five. And what part were you? Gretel. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and they, uh, yeah, it was explained to me. Like, I would, they, every time I would come on stage, people would laugh. And I, was, I would cry. And, they, and the director was like, no, it's great if people laugh. That means they love you, and you made them happy. And I was like, oh. And that totally changed things. But yeah, people. People would laugh, and uh, and I embraced it. And so my sister would dress up like um, like princesses and like characters that already existed. And she would always there was always like one bite missing out of all the apples in our fridge because she would like Snow White like take a bite of it and like roll. And we had a glass coffee table, and she would lay under it until somebody like came and kissed her. <laughs> and uh, and I would just make up these like strange Eastern European characters. And I don't even know where they came from. But yeah, that I should give shorter answers. <laughs> I'm going to give shorter answers. So when did you realize that was a talent that could translate really to the stage past your five-year-old sound of music? <laughs> um, yeah, just doing plays. I, yeah, I, I did a lot of shows. And in college, I was. I was either the villain or the funny one in all the shows, or the one who would take her clothes off. For I obviously was born without boundaries. Um, <laughs> but I never thought I would make a living from it. Um, yeah. Did you have a backup plan? No, I never had any plan. Yeah, I didn't even have a plan for performing. No. I like would just go job to job, working at Forever 21, then being a pedicab driver, shampoo girl. Shampoo girl, really? Yeah, I was the worst. I lied and said I had a lot of experience. And that's something you really need to be good at. Like, yeah, because I was too gentle. And there was a guy that had, like, you know, male pattern baldness where it's, like, just hair around the back and then a little thing here. So I was just washing his hair. <laughs> and he's like, wash my whole head. But I'm like, no, it's spraying off your head at me. <laughs> so, yeah, I got, fi I got fired from all my jobs pretty quick. Yeah, I had no backup plan. Yeah, but I mean now, even now, it's like I don't know what's going to happen. I'm, I really take good care of both my siblings so that one day I'll be able to kind of Blanche Dubois my way over there and <laughs> they'll have to just like, yeah, just like Blue Jasmine take care of me. What, do you, do you remember what your first material, like what your, when you first went up on stage? 
What was it like? Why are you doing this to me? <laughs> it was terrible. It was, um, the two jokes I remember were, one was about, and just like remember I had curly bangs. Just like for visual, okay? How old were you? I was 23. I know what you're saying, like you should have already known, but I didn't. And uh, I went up and I was like, skywriting. That's stupid, right? It's always fading. If a guy proposed to me that way, I would be like, nah. Like, it's, there's, no, there's no end to this or you're gonna laugh. Like, this is 11 years ago. And, uh, and then about the, the New York City Crosstown bus, I wrote a joke where it was like, just that they, anytime you feel it like kind of go down when they like let the air out of that front tire, you know somebody atrocious is about to get on. Like, just like some leg that they have to carry. Look, it was 11 years ago. Nobody write a blog about that that's offensive to them from 11 years ago. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think we can all be glad that you're not doing public, public My bus mom jokes. takes the bus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're all lucky. Real inside baseball New York joke. But, but that moment when you're being on stage and maybe it didn't go so well, it still somehow it made you want to do it again and again. Why? Masochism. I seriously, any, any person who's a comedian is a masochist and delusional. And yeah, and I was you definitely hear that, those though, things. But you really think that's true? A hundred percent. If someone's like, okay, so you're gonna do this thing for the next uh, eight years, and no one's gonna tell you you're good, and you're not gonna be good, and you're gonna have to live on the road in hotel rooms, making very little money. Uh, yeah, and like it'll just be it's constant rejection. It's not like an audition. It's like every sentence out of your mouth, people are like, no. And you're like, OK, what about this sentence? Um, it's, I'm in a great place right now, but being a stand-up is a hard-ass life. And it's, you think it's going to be fun. You're like, oh my god, if I can just quit my, my bartending job. Like Everyone just wants to quit their day job for their dream. But then when you get there, you're like, oh, this sucks too. Like I'm no happier now than I was when I was waiting tables. <laughs> I'm always pretty happy, but it's, there's no, I think we're all just always the same amount happy. Again, shorter answers, Amy, shorter answers, shorter answers. Sorry, I, nobody really talks to me unless they're interviewing me, so I have to like, I have to like get a lot out. Soon I'll be alone in my apartment again. <laughs> Can I just about that? Um, it's embarrassing now because I get recognized that I really am like myself, so people, and now you're coughing, like I'm so sorry. Do you want some water? You're being a real problem. Um, I, I wore a dress that was too tight because I'm always like gaining and losing weight, so I went outside my apartment because I, I can't zip myself and I have no one to ask to zip me. So I would like ask these, this like stranger on the street, I'm like, hi, like will you zip me? And she's like, oh, Amy Schumer. And I'm like, yeah, like I really am lonely. Um, and then she wasn't enough, so we had to get another person to come over to hold it. And it's just, they're like, oh, wow, we thought that was like a character. <laughs> I'm like, no, it's real. Well, that's what people always want to know when they interact with famous people is yeah. whether they are the same in person as they are on right. TV and because you started as a stand-up and that was your sort of more real self out yeah. there you are more like no I'm not okay. I'm like Daniel Day-Lewis like <laughs> I leave here and I put on like a top hat and I garden and that's me um, that's just what I picture he does I have no idea yeah no it's it's pretty close the, the difference is I am a little bit of an intro introvert uh, I get overwhelmed in crowds and um, and I don't get like really wasted that often. I did this week, but it was because like I was in Akron. <laughs> um, like, what are you gonna do there? Just be like, oh. Uh, and uh, yeah, and I don't, I don't have uh, sex very often. But hopefully that's gonna change at the Mac store. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just also say, and I don't know. Okay, so somebody tried to hack me because they assume I have like lots of naked photos, but like jokes on them because I've never put my face in them and I haven't taken them for like 10 years because of how I'm aging. And so they sent this like detective guy over my house this weekend to like help me secure all my shit. 
And he, and like they knew him. They were like, no, we're sending this guy over to you, my business manager. And then he got there and I like, he buzzed. I didn't even brush my teeth. I rolled out of bed and he was like so hot. And like, wouldn't you give your friend a heads up if you're like, okay, like just know that this guy coming to your house is so hot. You're gonna wanna at least brush your teeth and put like, just something, just do something. How'd it go? Bad. <laughs> he was like, I'm sorry, uh, I didn't know Nell lived here. Like, can you, I thought a woman lived here. Like, why is this garbage pail kid answering your door? I, I think I probably could have swung it yeah, if I wanted sure. to. I feel special because one time the cable guy asked me out. Really? But that was also a little creepy because he already knew he where I lived. He knows where you live. And like all Can my he tell what you're watching? I don't know. Yeah. One time I was buying birth control and the pharmacist asked me out. <laughs> anyway. But, um, <laughs> what's going on with you guys? Like, what's up with you guys? Sure. Someone came here to like find out how to make a film and I'm like, here's what's up with my pussy. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Meet the filmmaker. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, let's talk about let's talk about the way that you're handling attention because to yeah. me, as somebody who who has met a lot of people who are in your position, not all of them handle it as elegantly and smoothly as you have. I and just said pussy thirty seconds ago. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Do you have like a support system that you lean on? Are there people that you're going to for nope. advice? <laughs> My sister's right there, like, I will cut you. <laughs> um, yeah, well, my sister and I are really close. We're together a lot. And she, you know, just reminds me that I'm garbage. And uh, I have no yes men in my life. There's no one that uh, remotely thinks that I can, that I should trust myself. Uh, and the people I've gone to for advice, I have. I've talked to Chris Rock and, and Louis CK and... Uh, and Louie Anderson, no, I'm just kidding, <laughs> and Lena. Just not, not so much about everything, but just when things come up. I have, I have good people who've been in similar situations, I think. But uh, yeah, you think I'm handling it okay? I think so. All right, It's cool. impressive, what do you guys think? You guys? All right. Your sister's like, no, I don't wow. know. <laughs> That's rude. Yeah, who knows? But part of that must be having a voice on your show that you can deal with issues as they come up, right? It's more like when you're born physically flawless, <laughs> that gives you a certain level of confidence. Um, no, I don't, you know what, you're right. Because it's like I'm learning all these new things and I'm like, oh, I can't wait for season four to, to showcase these things. And uh, so it, 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 it's therapeutic and, and uh, yeah, it's, it's good to have a... A voice. Out as there. you're as you're working on the show, are you thinking of jokes that you want to tell or issues that you want to address? How does that work for you? Um, well, we'll come into the I'll come to the season with a couple things that I really want to address, or maybe a very specific idea like Twelve Angry Men. And and sometimes it's an issue, but more often than not, it's just like a, an idea that we think is funny. I'll just come in and be like, I think I should pop out of a cake, and like overhear my boyfriend saying that he isn't attracted to me anymore, but still have to like pop out of his surprise birthday cake. You know, and there's like little messages throughout, but usually it just starts with a dumb idea. Was that how the movie started too? No, um, the movie started because J I met with Judd and, he, and I kind of came armed with an idea just in case. And we had a good meeting and he, was like, well, if you ever have an idea, the door's open. And I was like, well, I have an idea. You know, I'm big, like, seize the day. I'm a lot like Christian Bale in Newsies. Um, I, for some reason, cannot do an interview without mentioning Newsies. I don't know what it is. But um, open the gates. Uh, no, I, uh, and, and then that idea I wrote, but we, it was a little um, broad. Then he was like, well, what's going on with you right now? And what do you, and I was falling in love. And so this story was happening. I wasn't enjoying it. I was just scared. And you're like chemically altered, you know, and you're falling in love and it's not even fun. You're just, you just feel sick. You feel like sickened. And you're just scared about what you're gonna find out about the other person or what, if they'll catch you in a bad light, like in Clueless, did I stumble into some bad lighting? And uh, so my references are very updated. 
I'm like at the cutting edge. Another great movie. Um, remember the ice skating one? Chemistry. But uh, then we made the movie. Next question, though. I don't, um, but yeah, so I, I wrote scenes. I wrote I just scenes in no order, and then Judd and I kind of we would write out the beats, and oh, you see her in the office, and talk to her dad, and um, and I wrote a draft pretty quickly, and and I think a little over a month. I just I'm like a psycho, like I go under and uh, do it. And you were just kind of committed to telling some version of a, a very personal story. Yeah, yeah. Did you want that to be longer? Or? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, all your other questions have been fucking novels. Um, the war and peace answer. Is that because it's more fulfilling for you to tell that kind of story or because it was just happening in the moment for you? I like telling real personal stories, if you can't tell. and. Um, and it was good to write it when it was happening in the moment because I was really experiencing it and like I didn't I've been in love a couple times that I I didn't remember that that's what it felt like for me, so it was kind of good to be right. But then a lot of them were stories from other times in my life and but yeah I like it to be based on some truth that I or or but I also like to totally daydream and write fake stuff. Did your boyfriend know you were writing? A yeah, movie he knew. About him? I don't know if he knew I was writing about him or what. Um, I mean, that lasted very, very short after uh, I finished writing the movie. Yeah, and then the fairy tale ended. But you got a movie out of it, so. Worth it. <laughs> Let's uh, watch a, a little clip. Oh. Uh, maybe we could watch the one with Nikki. I really was great there. When, one of the things you told me when you, when you were thinking about writing this movie is you wanted to write a character who had a lot of sex and was not judged for it, which is not a thing that we typically see in movies with women as the lead. Yeah, I definitely, um, I feel like with my stand-up, I've gotten this kind of attention where I'll, I'll talk about sex a lot, but just because it's funny, not because I'm having so much of it. Like I always say, and I mean it, like I loved the show Sex in the City, like everyone else. Uh, but the character of Samantha, like I didn't experience her as like the fun one. Like I was like, she, if my friend were behaving like that, I would like take her to the hospital, you know? And uh, yeah, you know? <laughs> and, and I don't think it's like a, I'm not like, you should be able to fuck as much as you want and you love it. Like I don't, I think that's nuts. Um, yeah, it's a self-destructive thing to do, but and I would say when I was a sophomore in college, that was my behavior. I was like in so much pain and I lost all my self-esteem and I was like, I'm just gonna not get attached to one guy and I was like, maybe I'll be the girl that sleeps around. And I, you know, I tried that and, uh, and it was horrible, <laughs> you know? Just like when you break up with someone when you're younger and, you and you're like, I'm gonna sleep with someone else. And then you go out and it makes you, you're in so much more pain <laughs> than you would have been in. So, but then there's this other thing where I've mostly been in long relationships and then in between them I've slept with a person or two and I like to tell stories about it on stage because something ridiculous or awful always happens and so just from a woman being on stage talking about sex and I'm saying things like I say like I've never had anal no one's ever come on my face <laughs> but just saying those and those, that's true but just saying those things like broaching those subjects people are just like Oh, she's the sex girl. She's like a whore. I bet she's down to fuck. And uh, and it's like no, I just like want to talk about it. And and so I think that I'm really proud of what we were able to do with this movie because I think you you learn a lot about someone rather than just a snap judgment of like oh that girl is like slutty. You're like oh well this is where she's coming from and this is what's going on with her. And so I, I hope people leave it a little less ready to judge a woman who's sexually active outside of wedlock or in order to conceive a child, you know, it's insane. Was it a challenge for you as an actor? This is your, obviously your first feature film, the longest performance that you've given, you know, the most in-depth character that you've played, even if it's somebody that you wrote. How did you prepare for that? I prepared for it the same way I prepare for um, any scene on my TV show. I went to a two-year Meisner program in New No, I'm dead That's serious. That's true, guys. <laughs> I went to college for acting, and then there's a teacher named William Esper in New York, and I studied with Bill for two years, 
And then I was in his master class also. So believe it or not. And we, tr we really do try to... I've, I don't know how to write a sketch. Like, I know it's a sketch show, but I, I just write it like scenes. Um, so in the, with the technique that I studied, you're supposed to live truthfully under imaginary circumstances. And so really live it out. And so on the TV show, you know, we, we love hiring great New York actors because we... We we play it real. We we don't. It's not very slapsticky. And so, I would just prepare and do my work, and then try and let it all go and live it out. And uh, and it was just way less stressful than my TV show because we have no money. We have to shoot three scenes in a day. And the movie, it was like, oh yeah, we're gonna shoot the baby shower scene kind of over a week. I was like, what? <laughs> like, we don't need to like shoot this actor out by six because they're on Law and Order, you know. Yeah. But you also had your first sex scenes, which was a challenge. I wish these were my first sex scenes. <laughs> Did you guys watch the show Delocated? John Glazer's show it was on Adult Swim. My first sex scene was with Eugene Merman. And uh, he was supposed to be having, he was supposed to be losing his virginity to me. We were supposed to be wasted. And at the same time he's having his first orgasm, he finds out that his dad died. So he's kind of like scream crying and drooling and coming. <laughs> And I'm under him, and, and it was the kind of thing where at first, like, it was like I was really trying to make him comfortable because he was shy. I was like, oh my God, like, don't worry, and whatever. And then I was like, oh, he's comfortable. Um, and, uh, and then when it, and I was like walking down the stairs at the end of the shoot day, and I was like, oh, my acting teacher told us, like, some days you'd just be playing the girl who gets fucked. And, uh, and then when I went to the premiere party for the episode, I had been fully cut out. Like you could tell that somebody was getting like rammed, but you couldn't tell that it was me. I was like, oh, they're like, oh yeah, Adult Swim. Like with, we're not, we weren't allowed to show that. I'm like, did you maybe think about not shooting that? Like maybe a, a body pillow would have been cool. So, but the sex scenes in the movie were, were uh, easier than that. Most of them. You, you did a lot of prep work, you told me, for the movie. Like, oh, that sounds like I like fucked a lot. No, no, that, that's not where I was going with <laughs> oh, that. Okay. But, no. Um, no, but you, you studied up on surgery for, for Bill Hader's character. Yeah. But, but uh, you, you cast LeBron James. Is it true that you wrote a part for him because you didn't know any other basketball players? No, I don't know any other basketball players. Like, now I do, because Amari Stoudemire is also in the movie. Um, my friend used to date David Lee, so I know that name's a basketball. But uh, no, have, have I mean, you do you know Le other basketball players? Have play? you seen LeBron play ever? Never, except in the movie. He plays in a scene in the movie. I have never seen him play basketball, but I heard he's good. <laughs> he's good. He's the best, by the way. He's hilarious. We did a screening, like a premiere in Akron, which is why I got like blacked out. And, uh, and he's just the sweetest. He's just, he's like a little boy. Like I turned around, he's like laughing at the movie, and he's just kind of watching it. And I was like, "You're so cute." Um, do you guys want to see another clip, or do you want to? Yeah. Like, what's All the right. vibe? All right. Does anybody want to sing? One, let's, <laughs> let's watch the other clip. So that's a moment where you're playing a real emotional, honest moment, but also playing it for laughs. So how do you keep that balance when you're writing or acting? Ooh, good question. You should do this. Um, well, in living it out, like, there's nothing that makes me personally feel more vulnerable than having a person that I'm attracted to and interested in in front of me telling me they like me. Because feeling deserving of love has been a definite obstacle that I was going through while I was writing this movie. I go through it all the time. And... Uh, so there's another scene where he he says that he read some of my stuff. And, you know, like, if somebody's like, oh, I read your, like, you're just like, can I just become a puddle on the floor? Like, you're, it's just, a feel, yeah, I was feeling really vulnerable in that scene. And especially, like, I went into that scene just thinking, I'm going to tell him it's over, and he'll be like, okay, cool. So just being, he just really threw me off my course. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it was fun to be surprised by someone. You know, that's rare. Yeah. I think people might be surprised to hear you talk about vulnerability because you have so much confidence on stage and in the way that you deal with the public. But that's maybe one of the things that drives you to deal with that. Yeah. Well, you guys aren't going to tell anybody, right? Like, everybody in here is going to be cool about it. Um, 
it's just a different thing uh, with stand up. You have you have to be really strong and commanding, and you're telling the audience your thoughts. If I went up there and I was like, "You guys, like, do I look gross?" <laughs> like, just you know, it's uh, it's a different thing. But with acting, it's you got to. But still, in my stand up, I think I've become more vulnerable. But you need to ha keep a certain level of, of authority. Uh, I'm going to go to one of our um, social media questions. Uh, Chris Cabanillas, I think I'm pronouncing that right, Restif Bard, says, Amy, where do you find the courage to be so damned funny? Um, just ignorance and... <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think something's wrong with me. I've always been an asshole, right, Kim? Yeah. Thank you for your question. <laughs> um, all right, what about, let's see. Oh, this is a good one. Uh, the Duchess, the Duchess SF asks, what are your best maneuvers to run out on a bad date? Go to the bathroom, run through the kitchen, anything else? Okay, well, like this wasn't a date, but one time this guy wound up being uncircumcised. And, um, and like, no offense, you guys, but like I had never dealt with that before, and he did not give me a heads up. So, no, no care? Oh, no pun intended, thank you. I thought my publicist was yelling at me, but she was punching up my joke. Um, <laughs> thanks, Care. Uh, and uh, so I, I just like saw it, and uh, it wasn't well kempt. And I was like, you know what? I really, uh, I just realized I'm not over my ex-boyfriend. Like, I just made up an excuse. And actually, the first, the, the shirt that I'm wearing in the first scene in the movie it's kind of a complicated shirt to get back on. And it, that night I had kind of a complicated shirt on. And so I'm laughing, like, because I can't get my fucking shirt on. And, and I'm like, yeah, well, I just thought I was over him, but I'm not. And, and I'm just getting redressed. And I'm, but I was just laughing because it was just such a horrible excuse. So that's like a date. <laughs> <laughs> Does that stuff, will that kind of stuff end up in, in movies, on stage, sort of naturally? I talked about it. I talked about it on stage at some point. Um, yeah, I hope he didn't see it. He was French, so maybe he didn't see it. I guess they don't do that there, but I'm a Long Island Jew. Like, everybody's at a breast where I'm from. Um. Hi, guys. Single. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's talk about talking about some of these cultural differences and issues. It's gotten you in some hot water recently. What do you mean? I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Were you expecting that kind of reaction at some point? Yeah. Well, well, you and I talked about it before that happened like a month ago. I just, the, like, I've, got, I've gotten very famous lately, you guys. Like, it's very weird. It's very new. And when that happens, you're kind of treated like a politician, like little Ariana Grande is like publicly apologizing for like eating a donut. I didn't read about it, but but it's just like all of a sudden, like, where do you stand on capital punishment? You're like, what? Like, I have a lower back tattoo. Get out of here. <laughs> but um, so when I started out, I was telling jokes like um, that were racist and I was really good at writing them and but against everybody you know it's like everybody got some and and um and it, part of my thing was to play like a really kind of irreverent idiot and that was my character like I was a character on stage the whole time now I talk like myself a lot more in my hour special I was starting to be more of myself but I still had some jokes in there just they were a little shocking and it didn't look, I didn't look like someone who was gonna say stuff like that and I got a good response from it. And I, as I've been having more eyes and ears on me, I, I realize that I have more of a responsibility. I think when, when, you know, even like a musician gets bigger and they're like, look, little girls look up to you. Like you can't just like, like sh be showing your asshole at an award show. I think, and they're like, no, it's not my fault. They look up to me. I'm like, okay, people are listening to me, and they and my words might hold weight for some people. So I'm gonna, I'm not gonna do that stuff anymore. So I haven't done, I haven't done jokes like that for a couple of years. I mean, if I think of a great one, I'm gonna say it to my friends. Um, but I, so I don't regret any joke I've ever told. I don't apologize for my jokes. They got me where I am today, and it was all very worth it. And the. And I, you know, I feel a little bit naive and, and uh, I feel like silly. I think I told you this. Just, I kind of thought 
that I could um, maybe bypass that and just say, hey, can we not do the thing where you guys like burn me at the stake for some miscommunication? Like, can we not do that? I'm a comic. Don't make me. A and they were like, no, this is how we do it. It's kind of like it's like with um, with photographers, like with paparazzi. You're like, wait, can we have a different system? Where you you don't scream at me and like I'll just look in everyone's lens and we'll and it'll be cool and but it's like no we want to do we have a way we do it and you're gonna have to do it this way and so I just I just feel like it's par for the course and I was not surprised about that stuff and I'm just gonna do my best with it and and I learned from my friends who uh, are successful comics and actors not to not to answer back not to address it. And I wish I could, because I love communicating. I love having an open door. And if someone asks me a question or they're offended by a joke, I like to say, well, what was it? And let's talk about it. But yeah, it's, it's just been explained to me that you just can't, you can't answer. So that's like a sad new thing. But that said, while that you have this attention on you and this yeah. kind of platform, you are, you are using it because you want to talk about things that matter to you. And one yeah. of those things is kind of progressive and feminist ideas, right? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah, so I'm just going to try to use it for good. But if nobody's going to be perfect, you know, and it's like if I'm doing 90 minutes of jokes and everything's funny and you're laughing and then I say one that hits a little too close to home for you, of course you have a right to be offended by that one thing. You can feel however you want. But but like what about the the rest of the time? And is that fair to say, well, I don't like you now. Like, if you don't like one song, do you stop listening to that musician? There's, there's just more pressure on comics now. But I'm just going to try to keep doing what I've been doing always and saying stuff that I think is funny. And, and, and you know, just more and more, I, I just it's about injustice and things that I feel like are unfair. I also have just dumb jokes still, <laughs> like just stupid, stupid shit. But... Um, but uh, I'm, yeah, I'm handling it the best I can. And if some arbitrary fact, something happens and, and I wind up having to take a fall for it, I feel like it's totally out of my hands. This could have brought it down well, or we're, whatever. We're, we're about to go into the audience Q&A, so there's still oh, time. Well, then there's let's, let's time burn all the bridges I have yeah. left. <laughs> uh, I think there are some folks with mics that will help you out if you want to raise your hands. Hi, Amy. Hello. Uh, I saw your screening of the movie a few months back when you did it here, and uh, you helped me with pickup lines last time. Oh, um, cool. Yeah. Uh, so I love terrible movies, not that Trainwreck is one. Um, do you have, like, a favorite, like... <laughs> no, Trainwreck's good. Trainwreck's good. Uh, do you have, like, a favorite, like, bad sci-fi original type movie? And if you could, like, make one of your own, or if you could be the monster in one, like, what would you be? Thank you for picturing me as the monster in a sci-fi movie. Ooh. I loved Species. I remember seeing that with my brother, and uh, Natasha Henstridge was so hot. Like, it didn't matter how stupid, the horrible the plot was. Um, and if I were going to be a monster in a sci-fi movie, I think I'd want to look just like this, you know? But, like, decapitate people and, like, eat them. And then, like, shit them out. And, like, eat them again. That's mine! <laughs> Hi, Amy. Hi. I want to know what you personally think differentiates a successful working comedian and actor from the uh, one who's not working as much or less su successful. Okay. Um, I think the non-working actor is still plagued with hope <laughs> that they'll be happy once they get work and that their parents will be proud of them. Um, whereas the working actor is a little less happy because their hope is gone. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Amy, back here. Hi. Hey, uh, first, I just have to say, you are such a tremendous talent, and I am incredibly grateful that I have access to your material. I Thank hope that you. you stick around for a really long time. Thank you so um, much. Yeah, and so my question is, so I imagine in the last three years, as you said, you've gotten more and more famous. There have been more people in your life, agents, publicists, you know, writers, people giving you a lot of advice. This is how you have to be. These are the things that you should or shouldn't do as a celebrity. What are some things that you have really had to push back against? Well, honestly, um, what I've learned is not to listen to anyone. For real. Yeah. The people advising me are great. And other than my publicist, like, no bullshit. She knows what's up. She let me fall in front of Kanye and Kim. Like, she doesn't... She's cool. 
But, you know, a lot of people told me to host The Daily Show. A lot of people have told me to do a lot of different things. I've just said, no, I don't want to be the the funny friend in a shitty mood. Like, I'm going to wait. And so I haven't listened... I never listened to my teachers that I didn't respect. And uh, yeah, so it's really been, any time I haven't followed my instincts, I've been burned. So I've really learned to listen to myself more. Except in Akron. Next. <laughs> One right in the front here to the left. Oh, okay, I thought you were doing it with my friend. We gotta take his question, because we have a lot of like air to clear. Hi, Amy. Hi. Um, can you read us the funniest text you've received recently? Oh, do you have my phone? The funniest text I've received. Yeah, would you grab my phone? That'll be fun. Let's take a question from this guy while we look. Can I interject oh, yeah, a funny up? text that you sent when, when, we, when we met? It was the day that Colin Quinn's book was released. <laughs> uh, Amy's good friend and co-star in the movie. He plays her dad. And he has a memoir out now, right? Yes. It's like called col The Coloring Book. Everybody yeah. get it. Yeah. And... Uh, Amy, when I came up to talk to her, showed me a picture of her sister's dog taking a shit on the cover of Colin's book. And then she was like, the reviews are in Colin's book. And then she sent that picture to Colin, and I saw that he talked about it on Fallon. It's real, if you saw it, you yeah, saw that clip. It's she, a real really dump that. that's on his, his stupid book. Oh, okay, well this is a text that I just sent. So I had an hour off before coming here, so we went to the zoo, and um, there's a, my brother, we just started watching the show Black Mirror. Did you guys see the, f the first? Okay. So I don't think it's a spoiler that in the first, can I just tell you guys like what happens? Okay. Don't listen if you don't want to hear, but so the first episode, the, the prime minister, like there's a girl, <laughs> the princess, the duchess has been kidnapped and it, the only way that they'll give her back and not kill her is if the prime minister fucks a pig on television. You guys have to watch Black Mirror. And, um... <laughs> And so my brother was like, you know, it'd be funny if you guys did a remake, if you like did a parody of it next season, but like you were the pig. And um, my, my brother, who I'm very close to. And, uh, and so anyway, I sent him a picture of me with the pig at the zoo. Like, do you want to fuck this? Like, yeah. Hold on, let me just check my text really quick. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Well, no, no wacky question here because I really love the movie. Thanks. And uh, I thought th there were so many really touching scenes that, you know, we expected maybe a lot more wackiness. And I thought, I wanted to know when you did those scenes, were those uh, all strictly written or were those, imp were those improvised as much as uh, some of the comedy must have been improvised? Do you go off your own script or do you stick? We would always, f we would always do a couple takes totally on script and then... Um, and then a, li a little more free. So with the with the drama though, I think I think those scenes were pretty pretty true to the script, more so than the than the comedic ones. Sorry, like very many scones today. Um, <laughs> well, the zoo's by Alice's teacup, so like, what are you gonna do? Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, I think people are gonna be surprised because it is. I think it's a really funny movie, but there's like you know, it's also like a love story and kind of heartbreaking. So go see it. <laughs> Hi, over here. Hi. Hi. So I feel like all the other, I feel like your new movies now regarded as the modern day romantic comedy. And as before, the ones we've seen, the girl just is beyond perfect and everything she does with the boy is perfect and it all works out perfect. And I feel like your portrayal in Trainwreck is a very real modern day exchange between what's going on in life. Do you feel like this movie is going to set a precedent for what's to come? Or do you feel like this is just going to be that only movie that anyone ever made and, you know, it'll still go with the same formula? I like that question. What do you think? Oh my God, I hope it changes. I hope it changes too. Because it's so real. Yeah, I saw it in I New Orleans. It's like... With, with, when like Jennifer Lawrence came around and she's doing these interviews, I don't know about you, but I was like, yes, like a human who's not like... But she's so perfect. She's, she's perfect, but she's also like, I'm not perfect. Y you know, I mean, she's insanely gorgeous and maybe she wasn't the best example, but... <laughs> but it's just like, it really seems like it really surprises people when someone's a human being and isn't just like a spokesperson for themselves. I, I've also been blessed with not having a boss for a long time, so I don't have anybody managing me and telling me, like, don't say that stuff. Um, 
I hope so. It feels like people are responding to more and more honesty. And you, I don't know, but we also live here, so maybe in like Tulsa, they're just like, we just want models falling in love. So I don't know. I hope so, though. Me too. Yeah. Hey, girl. What's up, girl? You know, just the usual. Um, so I have a question. Uh, so when you're working on some new material and you think to yourself, okay, like this is a little edgy, like, you know, how do you decide whether it's overstepping the line or whether you think, like, I, this can fly? Like, who, who's around you? Is it your people or is it your instinct? It's straight up my sister. Okay. Because if everyone's like, no, and she's like, yeah, I'll do it. Um, yeah. It's In terms of if it's like, this is too inappropriate <laughs> and it's a mistake, I listen to her. Yeah. Um, but if she says, do it, and then I'll try it out in front of crowds, but the crowd's laughter is gospel, so... You know, so it's like a mixture of the, like your sister and your instinct and then the reaction you get from the audience. Yeah. And I flip a coin. No, I'm yeah. Just yeah. Yeah. That's it. She's been wrong and I've gotten in trouble. So I need a new system. <laughs> Thanks. Hey. Hey. So earlier you mentioned having um, issues in the past with self-esteem and that kind of stuff in the past or whatever, <laughs> like as of yesterday. And uh, I'm just wondering, like, what happened in your life or what transitioned to make you just this badass, confident chick? Thanks, girl. Um, yeah, what happened? Did something happen? Uh, it's a mixture of not caring anymore. Uh, you know, it just... You just really realize... When you realize that everyone hates themselves, everyone worth, worthwhile hates themselves. <laughs> I don't have any friends that are like, I just wake up and I'm like, thanks. Uh, yeah, it's just like understanding that we're all having a tough time and, and that there's just ups and downs. And I think, you know, I also think, because the first time I was on television was in 2007 and I was doing Last Comic Standing and Facebook just became a thing and people were really chiming in on whether or not they would have sex with me. <laughs> just, um, and uh, and it was around then that it was like, oh, feelings hurt, feeling okay, feelings hurt. And it was like, who's right? And I was like, they're both right. Some people, you're totally going to be their thing, and they'll be like, oh, my God, you're a fucking goddess. And then other people are like, you're vile, and I cannot believe anyone's ever been inside you. And, um, yeah, and it's just like they're both right, and it just doesn't matter. And it feels so good to fucking be yourself and to cut all the people out of your life that don't let you be yourself. Just being around people who, thank you, just my publicist. Um, yeah, just being around the people who make you feel good. And do you being, think it yeah. has something to do with being in your 30s also? Just getting A older? A little 30s. I'm psyched for 40s because, yeah, like as things are starting to drop and, and like there are new parts of you, um, yeah, you're like, oh, it's out of my hands. And I'm not doing surgery or anything, so it's like, fuck it. Yeah, little 30s. Yeah. And also realizing, like, that the guy, for me, like, the guy who wants to be with the perfect girl, like, uh, th that it's not a possibility, you know? So it's like, or whatever they consider. A, so it's like, this is how it's going to be. Like, I don't want to be hungry. I don't want to feel bad. Like, I, I really did. I ate several scones today. And, uh, <laughs> and the right person will, will think that's really great. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I think we'll, we'll, we'll go with uh, just one uh, last question. Since you seem so busy, people are wondering, what do you do with your time off? Oh, just like a lot of charity work. <laughs> and like baking for my friends. And like I love rare books. I love how they smell. I love the smell and records and... I just walk, like I just walk. Okay, I, uh, I, I do like going on long, creepy walks. Like I'm like taking a pilgrimage to Mecca. Um, I, I, I go see my niece every chance I get. She, um, we just taught her, Kim and I, when we see a hot guy, we go, you hoo 
And so we just taught her how to do that. She's like 18 months old and she can go, you and uh, does she get to judge who the hot guy is or you guys are telling her? No, we'll let her know. <laughs> like there's one and she's like, Ew. and uh, I love hanging out with my, my brother and my sister. We, we've been watching House of Cards and I'll like kind of spoon her dog and we get very drunk and then we say that we're not drinking tomorrow. And then we do. And, uh, and I, I still love seeing stand-up. I go hang out at the Comedy Cellar. My best friends are there. I like dancing with my girlfriends. We go out and dance like sluts. And um, yeah, just like doing a lot of 5Ks. <laughs> I think we'll leave it there. Thank, Thank you so you guys. much. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you for coming. So they sent this like detective guy over my house this weekend to like help me secure all my shit. And he, and like they knew him. They were like, no, we're sending this guy over to you. My business manager. And then he got there and I like, he buzzed. I didn't even brush my teeth. I rolled out of bed and he was like so hot. And like, wouldn't you give your friend a heads up if you're like, okay, like just know that this guy coming to your house is so hot. You're gonna wanna at least brush your teeth and put like, just something, just do something. How'd it go? Bad. <laughs> he was like, I'm sorry, uh, I didn't know Nell lived here. Like, can you, I thought a woman lived here. Like, why is this garbage pail kid? answering your door. I, I think I probably could have swung it yeah, if I wanted sure. to. I feel special because one time the cable guy asked me out. Really? But that was also a little creepy because he already knew he where I lived. He knows where you live. And like all Can my he tell what you're watching? I don't know. Yeah. One time I was buying birth control and the pharmacist asked me out. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but, um, what's going we on with you guys? Like, what's going on with you guys? Someone came here to like find out how to make a film, and I'm like, here's what's up with my pussy. <laughs> um, <laughs> meet the filmmaker. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, let's talk about let's talk about the way that you're handling attention, because to yeah. me, as somebody who who has met a lot of people who are in your position, not all of them handle it as elegantly and smoothly as you have. I just said pussy 30 seconds ago. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, do you have like a support system that you lean on? Are there people that you're going to for nope. advice? <laughs> my sister's right there, like, I will cut you. Um, yeah, well, my sister and I are really close. We're together a lot. And she, you know, just reminds me that I'm garbage. And uh, I have no yes men in my life. There's no one that uh, remotely thinks that I can, that I should trust myself. Uh, and the people I've gone to for advice, I have. I've talked to Chris Rock and, and Louis CK and, uh, and Louis Anderson. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and Lena. Just not, not so much about everything, but just when things come up. I have, I have good people who've been in similar situations, I think. But uh, yeah, you think I'm handling it okay? I think so. All right. It's cool. impressive. What do you guys think? You guys? All right. Your sister's like, mm, I don't wow. know. <laughs> That's rude. Yeah, who knows? But part of that must be having a voice on your show that you can deal with issues as they come up, right? It's more like when you're born physically flawless, <laughs> that gives you a certain level of confidence. Um, no, I don't, you know what, you're right. Cause it's like, I'm learning all these new things and I'm like, oh, I can't wait for season four to, to showcase these things. And uh, so it, 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 it's therapeutic and, and uh, yeah, it's, it's good to have a, a voice as there. You're, as you're I should give shorter answers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna give shorter answers. So when did you realize that was a talent that could translate really to the stage past your five-year-old sound of music? <laughs> um, yeah, just doing plays. I, yeah, I, I did a lot of shows, and in college I was, I was either the villain or the funny one in all the shows, or the one who would take her clothes off. For, I obviously was born without boundaries. Um, <laughs> but I never thought I would make a living from it. Um, yeah. Did you have a backup plan? No, I never had any plan. Yeah, I didn't even have a plan for performing. No, I like, would just go job to job working at Forever 21, then being a pedicab driver, shampoo girl, 
Shampoo girl, really? Yeah, I was the worst. I lied and said I had a lot of experience. And that's something you really need to be good at. Like, yeah, because I was too gentle. And there was a guy that had like, you know, male pattern baldness where it's like just hair around the back and then a little thing here. So I was just washing his hair. <laughs> and he's like, wash my whole head. But I'm like, no, it's spraying off your head at me. <laughs> so yeah, I got, fi I got fired from all my jobs pretty quick. Yeah, I had no backup plan. Yeah, but I mean now, even now, it's like I don't know what's gonna happen. I'm, I really take good care of both my siblings so that one day I'll be able to kind of Blanche Dubois my way over there and <laughs> they'll have to just like, yeah, just like Blue Jasmine take care of me. What, do you, do you remember what your first material, like what your, when you first went up on stage, what was it like? Why are you doing this to me? <laughs> it was terrible, it was, um, the two jokes I remember were, one was about, and just like remember I had curly bangs. Just like for visual, okay? How old were you? I was 23. I know what you're saying, like you should have already known, but I didn't. And uh, I went up and I was like, skywriting. That's stupid, right? It's always fading. If a guy proposed to me that way, I would be like, nah. Like, it's, there's, no, there's no end to this or you're gonna laugh. Like, this is 11 years ago. And, uh, and then about the, the New York City Crosstown bus, I wrote a joke where it was like, just that they, anytime you feel it like kind of go down when they like let the air out of that front tire, you know somebody atrocious is about to get on. Like, just like some leg that they have to carry. Look, it was 11 years ago. Nobody write a blog about that that's offensive to them from 11 years ago. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think we can all be glad that you're not doing public, public My bus mom jokes. takes the bus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're all lucky. Real inside baseball New York joke. But, but that moment when you're being on stage and maybe it didn't go so well, it's still somehow it made you want to do it again and again. Why? Masochism. I seriously, any, any person who's a comedian is a masochist and delusional. And yeah, and I was you definitely hear that, those though, things. But you really think that's true? A hundred percent. If someone's like, okay, so you're gonna do this thing for the next uh, eight years, and no one's gonna tell you you're good, and you're not gonna be good, and you're gonna have to live on the road in hotel rooms, making very little money. Uh, yeah, and like it'll just be it's constant rejection. It's not like an audition, it's like every sentence out of your mouth, people are like, no, and you're like, okay, what about this sentence? Um, it's, I'm in a great place right now, but being a stand-up is a hard-ass life, and it's, you think it's gonna be fun, you're like, oh my God, if I can just quit my, my bartending job, like everyone just wants to quit their day job for their dream, but then when you get there, you're like, oh, this sucks too. Like, I'm no happier now than I was when I was waiting tables. <laughs> I'm always pretty happy, but it's, there's no, I think we're all just always the same amount happy. Again, shorter answers, Amy, shorter answers, shorter answers. Sorry, I, nobody really talks to me unless they're interviewing me, so I have to like, I have to like get a lot out. Soon I'll be alone in my apartment again. <laughs> Can I just about that? Um, it's embarrassing now because I get recognized that I really am like myself, so people, and now you're coughing, like I'm so sorry. Do you want some water? You're being a real problem. Um, I, I wore a dress that was too tight because I'm always like gaining and losing weight, so I went outside my apartment because I, I can't zip myself and I have no one to ask to zip me. So I just like ask these, this like stranger on the street, I'm like, hi, like will you zip me? And she's like, oh, Amy Schumer. And I'm like, yeah, like I really am lonely. Um, <laughs> and she wasn't enough, so we had to get another person to come over to hold it. And it's just, they're like, oh wow, we thought that was like a character. <laughs> I'm like, no, it's real. Well, that's what people always want to know when they interact with famous people is yeah. whether they are the same in person as they are on right. TV and because you started as a stand-up and that was your sort of more real self out yeah. there you are more like no I'm not okay. I'm like Daniel Day-Lewis like <laughs> I leave here and I put on like a top hat and I garden and that's me um, that's just what I picture he does I have no idea yeah no it's it's pretty close the, the difference is I am a little bit of an intro introvert uh, I get overwhelmed in crowds and um, 
and I don't get like really wasted that often. I did this week, but it was because like I was in Akron. <laughs> um, like, what are you gonna do there? Just be like, oh. Uh, and uh, yeah, and I don't, I don't have uh, sex very often. But hopefully that's gonna change at the Mac store. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just also say, and I don't know, okay, so somebody tried to hack me because they assume I have like lots of naked photos, but like jokes on them because I've never put my face in them and I haven't taken them for like 10 years because of how I'm aging. And so... If you're working on the show, are you thinking of jokes that you want to tell or issues that you want to address? How does that work for you? Um, well, we'll come into the, I'll come to the season with a couple things that I really want to address. Or maybe a very specific idea, like 12 Angry Men. And, and sometimes it's an issue, but more often than not, it's just like a, an idea that we think is funny. I'll just come in and be like, I think I should pop out of a cake and like overhear my boyfriend saying that he isn't attracted to me anymore, but still have to like pop out of his surprise birthday cake. You know, and there's like little messages throughout, but usually it just starts with a dumb idea. Was that how the movie started too? No. Um, the movie started because J I met with Judd and, he, and I kind of came armed with an idea just in case. And we had a good meeting and he was like, well, if you ever have an idea, the door's open. And I was like, well, I have an idea. You know, I'm big, like, seize the day. I'm a lot like Christian Bale in Newsies. Um, <laughs> I, for some reason, cannot do an interview without mentioning Newsies. I don't know what it is. But um, open the gates. Uh, no, I, uh, and, and then that idea I wrote, we, it was a little um, broad. But then he was like, well, what's going on with you right now? And what do you, and I was falling in love. And so this story was happening. I wasn't enjoying it. I was just scared. And you're like chemically altered, you know, and you're falling in love. And it's not even fun. You're just... You just feel sick. You feel like sickened. And you're just scared about what you're going to find out about the other person or what if they'll catch you in a bad light, like in Clueless. Did I stumble into some bad lighting? And uh, so my references are very updated. I'm like at the cutting edge. Another great movie. Um, remember the ice skating one? Chemistry. But uh, then we made the movie. Next question, though. I don't, um, but. Yeah, so I, I wrote scenes. I wrote I just scenes in no order, and then Judd and I kind of, we would write out the beats, and oh, you see her in the office, and talk to her dad, and um, and I wrote a draft pretty quickly, and and I think a little over a month. I just I'm like a psycho, like I go under, and uh, do it. And you were just kind of committed to telling some version of a, a very personal story. Yeah, yeah. Did you want that to be longer? Or? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, all your other questions have been fucking novels. Um, the war and peace answer. Is that because it's more fulfilling for you to tell that kind of story or because it was just happening in the moment for you? I like telling real personal stories, if you can't tell. And, um, and it was good to write it when it was happening in the moment because I was really experiencing it and like, I didn't, I've didn't. i been in love a couple times, but I, I didn't remember that that's what it felt like for me. So it was kind of good to be right. But then a lot of them were stories from other times in my life. And But yeah, I like it to be based on some truth. that I, or, or But I also like to totally daydream and write fake stuff. Did your boyfriend know you were writing a yeah, movie he knew. about him? I don't know. All right, everybody, let's welcome Amy Schumer. Mwah, mwah. Oh, hello. Thank you so much for coming. Is this an exciting crowd? Some of them. <laughs> you guys, could you just keep it down in the store? Thank you. <laughs> Hi, guys. Were you just in the neighborhood, or did you come here on purpose, or what? Purpose? Yeah. On purpose. All right, cool. Hi. Um, hi. Good to see you again. We got I didn't to wrote my article in the New York Times, if anybody saw it Sunday. Good article, right? I, I, I will tell this audience, if you guys promise not to tell anybody, that there was a lot of discussion about how much cleavage to use in the photo. Wow. Yeah. Did you fight for my tits? I think they, they spoke for themselves. Yes, they did. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 
And what's the other thing that you had to fight for? Oh, you know, the Times, as you guys probably know if you read the paper. Edgy. They're, <laughs> They don't play by the rules. There's some language that, that we don't typically allow, but you know, when Amy says that she's always been hosed before bros, we gotta put that in, right? You gotta put it in. Put it down. And yeah. then also, what kind of pet it's okay to <laughs> masturbate in front of. I wish it maybe take a vote later and see if there's the Why consensus. don't we do it now? Like okay. do you think it's okay to masturbate in front of your cat? Okay, who says no? Wow. Dog. Okay. It's kind of even. This is kind of an uptight crowd, and I, I don't really know how the rest of this is going to go. Well, let's, let's start from the beginning. You are getting, like, straight just a shot of my clitoris. Like, please. No, it's not your fault. It's in your face, and this dress didn't support underwear. So we all do what we have to. Uh, I want to talk to you about being funny from when you were a kid. Yeah. Your sister told me that you used to make up characters yeah. when you were little. Did you always have a sense that you were funny? I was always making people laugh, but I didn't think it was a good thing. It kind of bugged me because I felt like they were making fun of me, but they were, it was explained to me. Um, I, did a, I did a production of An uh, Sound of Music when I was five. And what part were you? Gretel. And, uh, and, and they, uh, yeah, it was explained to me. Like, I would, they, every time I would come on stage, people would laugh, and I, was, I would cry. And, they, and the director was like, no, it's great if people laugh. That means they love you, and you made them happy. And I was like, oh, and that totally changed things. But, yeah, people, people would laugh, and, uh, and I embraced it. And so my sister would dress up like, um, like princesses and, like, characters that already existed, and... She would always, there was always like one bite missing out of all the apples in our fridge because she would like Snow White, like take a bite of it and like roll and we had a glass coffee table and she would lay under it until somebody like came and kissed her. <laughs> and, uh, and I would just make up these like strange Eastern European characters and I don't even know where they came from, but yeah, that, 